So before we get started, of course, everyone's favorite part of lecture, have our clicker questions. Start here. Which of the following are coactivators not likely to interact with directly? RNA polymerase 2, the mediator complex, TF2D, DNA, or histones? So are not likely to interact with directly. So it's one way to look at questions like this would be to just rewrite them and say this is not likely to. So just flip them around. looks like this is something we don't need to talk anymore about. Yes, the definition of a coactivator is that it does not interact with DNA. Um, coactivators are known to interact directly with RNA polymerase and with the mediator complex and with TF2D and with histones. So the only thing that's left, even if it weren't part of the definition. So hopefully all the exam questions, final exam questions will be like this too. <laughs> So in the absence of the Bicoy gene, a reporter gene with the Eve, even skipped stripe 2 regulatory region, will express everywhere in the embryo, only in band 2 of the embryo, in band 2 of the embryo and posterior, in band 2 of the embryo and anterior, or nowhere in the embryo at all. We'll do another round of this. Yes? <laughs> OK, so we'll start again. Everyone will need to vote again. So I'm not counting down. <laughs> so um, let's start again. Yes? Start. Go. Here we are. I'm not quite sure why it gave me this polling stop. The polling is on, yes. So one minute left. Thirty seconds. Yep. Twenty. 
OK, so not many people are changing their minds. Uh, <clears throat> nobody likes everywhere in the embryo, or very few people like everywhere in the embryo. But otherwise, everyone's pretty much split about what um, is going on here. So evidently, I didn't do a job of, good job of explaining what was going on here. So the Bicoid gene is encoding what? It's a transcriptional activator. So if you look at the regulation of what's going on in band two, there are two transcriptional activators that have to associate with it. Right? Which ones are they? Bicoid and hunchback. Oop. And we've got all kinds of interesting lights going on here, too. Uh, <clears throat> so in the absence of activator, do you think you're going to be getting expression? No. no. So in the absence of activator, you're going to get expression anywhere? No. no. So it has nothing to do with band two or anything else. So the answer to this is nowhere in the embryo. OK, and that's it for clicker questions for today. So yes? So the question is, what's the role of hunchback? You need both activators. And this gets back to the question about synergy, that one just by itself is not enough to get full activation. And so you do actually need two in this case. And we'll talk a lot more about how these things are being regulated and going together in particular examples here. Yeah, another question? But there are no office hours after class today. No, unfortunately, I need to head back to the meeting that I'm supposed to be at now. Yeah? So Bitcoin and Hunchback are the activators of transcription. And then the repressors of transcription are Cripple and Giant. And we'll see that cripple is, turns out, really important for all kinds of other things, too. Okay, so what are the, like, vocabulary? Yeah, what are, the, what are the vocabulary? So activators plus repressors down. Of course, the problem is there are some that do both. And we'll see that today more and more, that it really depends on exactly where that particular gene regulatory protein, which includes both, is going to be binding to. Yeah, so today we'll talk a little bit about cell memory um, and then mostly about so-called master regulators and how these are the really important gene regulatory factors that are important for not just regulation of single genes but whole different gene cascades. And if we get to it, um, we'll talk a little bit more about regulatory circuits toward the end here. So when we started talking about gene regulation, we talked about uh, what makes a liver cell a liver cell, what makes a nerve cell a nerve cell. Um, a lot of that has to do with the combination, which is kind of why I had that clicker question that obviously I didn't do a good job of explaining, uh, combinations of different transcriptional regulators. And this is just an example and a purely theoretical example of how with relatively small numbers of regulatory genes, you can end up with completely different kinds of gene regulation. It all depends on the combination of those different genes. And so in this case, we have our prototypical embryonic cell. And then in one of the two cells that are generated by division, you have expression of one regulatory protein. So here it's on, there it's off. In the next division, you're going to have two and three to the left or right end, just in this particular division. Could be anterior or posterior if you're talking about it from something like a Drosophila embryo. And so here, the one on the left has two. Here, the one on the left has two. But it has one because it's from the right one to start with. And so on and so forth. You end up with a relatively small number of regulatory proteins, I hear five, and eight completely different cell types in terms of just the combination of gene regulatory proteins they have in each of those cells. And so some very simple left cell or right cell can determine the cell type just by what things are being expressed on it. And so it's that you know, combination of different regulatory factors which really seem to lead to things like nerve cell differentiation or liver cell differentiation, et cetera. So just some very, very simple rules can give you a huge amount of complexity. 
And one of the ways that people know about this is studying Drosophila, our friends the Drosophila embryos. This particular example is where you can express just one protein, and it's the eyeless protein, um, EY. And again, these are geneticists, so when they mutate this gene, there are no eyes. But if you express this gene in the wrong place, in this case, in cells that normally give rise to legs, there'll be an eye structure that forms on this leg. And that's, in fact, a Drosophila eye-like structure forming on the leg just because this eyeless gene is being expressed somewhere else. And what that says is that it's the activity of that one gene regulatory protein which leads to all kinds of other regulatory proteins being expressed. Um, and the way that, in fact, looks is here, um, the regulatory cascade. One thing to mention here, um, this particular image is actually not in the sixth edition of the textbook. It is in the fifth edition of the textbook. So if you're looking for it, that's the place to look. I will try and make sure there's a copy of that in the library if there isn't already. Has anyone looked to see the red version of the textbooks in the library? So not the blue one? Yeah, I'll make sure that that's there. Um, but this is the regulatory process that's all being driven by eyeless again. When you mutate this gene to lack of activity, you don't have eyes. So here, <clears throat> eyeless regulates a number of other genes, which then also will continue to regulate themselves. And these are the positive feedback loops that we'll be talking about more and more as we keep moving through here. And so once you have expression of one of these genes, it will continue to be expressed. And the wonderful Drosophila geneticists love to come up with cute names for things, and that's where a lot of these other genes in this process come from. Toy. What the heck is toy? Twin of eyeless. So if you mutate this, it gives you the same phenotype as eyeless, only it's a different gene. And so that tells you that these two are in the same regulatory pathway, and each of them gives you the same kind of feedback. SO, because we didn't have another name for it, it's Latin for without eyes, EYA, eyes absent. Um, and then finally, there's a completely different gene, Dachshund, or Dachshund, so that's a phenotype which gives a very strange looking embryo when you get rid of it. Um, but all of these are in a feedback process. Yes, question up there. So uh, when you said if you mutate toy, which is the same phenotype as eyeless, mm -hmm. so if you mutate it, it now becomes the same functional uh, phenotype as eyeless, or its mutation is the same as a mutated eyeless? Okay, so the phenotype you get in a mutant so the mutant phenotype of getting rid of twin of eyeless is the same as the mutant phenotype of getting rid of eyeless. And it turns out that if you do the experiment we just looked at on the last slide here, now if you put twin of eyeless and express it right here, what do you expect is going to happen? You get an eye on the leg, just like you do with eyeless. Okay. So um, that's the, the process here. Um, and again, the main thing here is this is all um, positive feedback loops that there are multiple different genes, they're still giving you the same phenotype, lacking the eyes. Um, and these multiple genes that are um, feeding into this particular process. Um, eyes are a really great thing to study in Drosophila because they're really easy to see. They're bright red, um, and if you're even looking with a hand magnifying glass, you can see that <laughs> these flies do or don't have eyes. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward process. Also the white eyes, white eyes versus red eyes. There's a whole, one of my favorite um, mutants is actually the um, sevenless gene, which is you know, one of the seven parts of the fly eye. And then there's the son of sevenless, so son of sevenless, and then the bride of the son of sevenless. Um, all of these different mutants that are involved in regulation of Drosophila development, again, just having to do with eyes. <laughs> uh, well, if you're interested, we can talk about that offline. Yeah, no, we want to talk more about it now. I think these are even cooler genes. So uh, we talked a little bit about the <clears throat> somatic cell nuclear transfer. When we talk about it, it's just about the DNA. So if you can take a nucleus from one particular cell, put it into an enucleated cell, you can get a development of a genetic clone of that particular first organism that you started with, where that nucleus came from. This has a number of 
ethical implications and lots of problems as well in terms of the process. So we also mentioned last time why we should care about gene regulatory proteins. I said that expression of just four regulatory proteins can lead to basically changing of the phenotype of a cell from something that's differentiated into a cell which can develop, in some cases, a whole organism. Um, turns out that four was the original paper. That was 10 years ago. Now we're down to three. You don't need you just expression of three separate gene regulatory proteins in a differentiated cell can lead to a cell which is basically like an embryo and can develop a whole organism. So these are called pluripotent stem cells. So a pluripotent means it can make everything. And again, in some cases, even a, a complete organism from it. Um, I stands for an induced pluripotent cell. Um, pluripotent cells are usually your embryonic cells. But the amazing thing is that by expression of these three proteins, you can get a cell which is differentiated to become a cell that looks a lot like an embryonic cell. This is really nice in terms of therapy because it means you can take a cell from a patient, change it into a stem cell, and then potentially make neurons, make muscles, treat Parkinson's, treat Alzheimer's, lots of different kinds of potential therapies. They're not quite in the clinic yet, but that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, sorry to just repeat it here, but um, do people think that you should be able to now use this and not need to have embryonic cells in terms of doing you know, human cell therapy, for instance? Yes, that's exactly the reason um, why people are really excited about this. You don't need embryonic cells anymore. You can induce pluripotency. Um, and in fact, there's a nice review here, which I'm not going to get into, um, talking about the progress that's happened in the last 10 years since this was published. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went for this um, in 2009. Um, these factors here are not particularly important. I mentioned Nanog before. It's one of those things that is binding to DNA. That was that fourth that, that we thought we needed. Turns out it's actually not anymore. But this one's particularly interesting, this KLF4. Who knows what KLF4 stands for? <laughs> yes, something factor is good. Um, cripple-like factor. So that cripple gene we were talking about in terms of Drosophila development turns out to be one of the three critical genes in terms of getting induced pluripotent stem cells. Who to thunk it? Now, this is why studying model organisms is a really useful thing to be doing here. A um, couple of other genes as well. Um, again, the, the names here are really not that critical. Um, but if you're interested, again, um, take a look. This particular whole issue actually is about um, induced pluripotent stem cells and, and how they're being used and hopefully eventually coming into the clinic um, relatively soon. So <clears throat> wanted to talk about that sort of the general aspect. These are all the sort of those master regulators like ILIS, et cetera, that you can put into the cell and get just amazing kinds of changes that happen. One of the things that I forgot to mention here and it's actually nicely described in this review article. A lot of this has to do with chromatin regulation. And so depending on the modification state of the individual histones, et cetera, these guys um, do a great job at sort of remodeling a lot of those histones and the histone complement in terms of getting the cells into this induced pluripotent state. Um, so a lot of the regulation that's happening here is not direct gene regulation, but also changing the chromatin. So <clears throat> that's the general overall regulators. There are a few regulators which are really well known. In fact, I should have brought up the image that when we went back and looked originally, and we had our DNA binding motifs, the zinc finger motifs. Um, one of the original zinc finger motifs was found in this particular protein the so-called glucocorticoid receptor. Um, glucocorticoid receptor is a gene regulatory protein. Surprise, surprise, it binds to glucocorticoids. When you have a glucocorticoid, these are steroid hormones, that bind to this receptor, it can now bind to DNA. In the absence of a hormone, it can't bind to DNA. So this is a nice regulatory process, actually a lot like you have with the repressors that you see in bacteria. 
So in the presence of a hormone, this glucocorticoid receptor will bind to DNA. It binds to DNA in concert with lots of other DNA binding proteins. And it turns out that what happens and what genes get turned on by the activated glucocorticoid receptor has to do with what other proteins are already present in particular cells. And so in liver cells, these are all going to be metabolic genes. So turn on cortisol means you're starving. That means you turn up all of the genes that you need to make all of the <clears throat> metabolic products that you need to survive. Other cells, it turns out that these steroid hormones, um, lots of steroid hormones are sex hormones. So those also are going to interact with various um, steroid hormone receptors and then turn on very different genes in different cells. And so it depends on exactly what other proteins are present there in terms of what happens. In some cases, the glucocorticoid receptor actually turns out to be a repressor, not surprisingly, because that's just where the binding site is that the glucocorticoid receptor is going to interact with. So this glucocorticoid receptor happened to have a binding site right here at the beginning of transcription, binding by the glucocorticoid receptor would block the association of any kind of polymerase. So that's where this is going to be serving as a, as a repressor and binding at the promoter. So this is just an example of one protein that can have lots of different effects all throughout a multicellular organism, all dependent on what other kinds of gene regulatory proteins are in that particular cell. Yeah? So the glucocorticoid hormone would be a coactivator, correct? So in this case, so the glucocorticoid hormone, so, sorry, the question was would the glucocorticoid hormone be considered a co-regulator? So if it's acting as a repressor, it would be one versus the other. Generally, people don't talk about these as co-activators or co-repressors. That would be specifically for proteins. This is a steroid, so it's a small chemical. So um, generally, the terminology, and getting back to your question about terminology, co-activators and co-repressors, at least in eukaryotic systems, are going to be separate proteins rather than an individual hormone or something like that. Oh, so it's multiple genes that are being turned on and off um, here. So it's not just one. Um, and that's sort of the idea is that it's one, it's one protein that can be regulating multiple different genes. Okay, then I want to talk a little bit about mating type switching. And this is getting back to our discussion about why modification of chromatin is so important. Uh, how many of you knew that yeast had two sexes? So uh, <clears throat> A's and alphas, um, and basically only the yeast can tell them apart. So if you have alpha cells, they will divide perfectly happily and stay alpha cells, except if they're under conditions where, and this is usually a starvation condition, they need to reproduce in a diploid state. And so the diploid state is now A and alpha. And this is, a, again, a wonderful model system for understanding development to some extent. You have a single-celled organism that can replicate in a haploid state or in a diploid state. But to be diploid, you have to have an A get together with an alpha. And so how does that happen? How do you have one organism in a haploid state change its sex? Really bizarre here. So turns out. The process is dependent on changing the DNA. And that changing in the DNA has to do with a particular part of the genome. And this is called the mating type locus in the genome. If a particular sequence at this mating type locus is alpha, then this is an alpha cell. If it's an A, it's an A type cell. And it switches back and forth from A to alpha. How the heck can that be happening? Well, it turns out that these genes aren't created from nothing, and they have to come from somewhere, which is this cassette mechanism. Yeah? Sorry, just to clarify, this slide was four. Yep. What is the N and the D signature? OK, so this would be, uh, in this particular case, um, mother and daughter. Okay. So that's all that that stands for here. So, um, but what can happen is, yeah, so from Mother cells can change, um, and the, the, when you have this 
division that takes place. You can also have you know, A's staying A's or A's switching to alpha. You can have both that happen there. And so this switching process, again, it's not brand new DNA that's come from who knows where, outer space. Um, it's other DNAs. All yeasts have a copy of the alpha type and the A type genes that they need to be expressing themselves as either an A or an alpha. These are what are called the cassettes. So you have an alpha and an A everywhere. A, in your A type, you've got A and alpha. In your alpha type, you've got A and alpha. And what happens is these silenced cassettes get inserted into the mat locus when you have mating type switching. How does that happen? It's an endonuclease activity that will cut in the mat locus. Well, what happens when you have endonuclease activity? Gives you a double stranded break. How do you repair double stranded breaks? I forgot that for the last midterm. So, two broad non homologous end joining, which would mess up the genes that are there, so that's not very useful. How else would you repair it? Homologous recombination. So that's exactly how this process works. You have homologous recombination. You have cutting by an endonuclease at this site, homologous recombination from one of these silent cassettes, because there's homology at, at either end here. So this switch is literally a homologous recombination event that happens because of the endonuclease activity. So that's how you get the switching. How do you make sure that these silent sites stay silent? Because they're in heterochromatin. So the heterochromatin. And one of the things that some of you may have noticed when we talked about chromatin remodeling complexes, they're often called SWISNF, S-W-I-S-N-F. S-W-I is a yeast geneticist term for switch. What kind of switching? Mating type switching. So if you don't have the activity of the silencing gene, you get far too much mating type switching because these loci are not silenced relative to each other. So it's a chromatin remodeling process and homologous recombination that lead to this switching type. And this is just another way of looking at that. Here are these <coughs> silent loci alpha and A, each of which are in heterochromatin, in fact, it turns out quite close to the telomeres, have these, here it's called a silencer, I would also call this an insulator sequence or a barrier sequence, which is keeping all of these guy, both alpha and A, unexpressed, except when you have your endonuclease cleavage here and the gene switching that takes place. So that's how it happens. You get endonuclease activity, and then after that endonuclease activity, homologous recombination that repairs from one side or the other. We won't get into details about exactly how that happens. But once you've done that, now your cell has to be either A or alpha. How is it staying A or alpha? It's one of these two states, either alpha, which has two gene regulatory proteins expressed, or A, which has one gene regulatory protein expressed. How do these guys interact with each other? They have basically three different sets of genes which they're going to regulate. One is A-specific genes. The other one is alpha-specific genes. And then we also have haploid-specific genes. So if you have now fused and you're now a diploid cell, you're going to want to express different genes than you would if you're a... <clears throat> a haploid cell. So you have three different possibilities here. You have an A type, which means that at the mat locus you have the A genes, which expresses mat A1. Mat A1 actually has no effect on these mating type related genes. The A specific genes are always on because of a separate protein here. Alpha-specific genes are off because they don't have stimulation of alpha-specific genes. And haploid-specific genes are also not being regulated by 
this particular protein. On the other hand, if you have a alpha cell where there are the two alpha gene regulators, those serve as either repressors of transcription for the alpha-specific genes, stimulators of alpha-specific genes, and still are haploid-specific genes, there's no regulator whatsoever. If, however, you now have a haploid cell, which has these two together, you have MAD-A1 and MAD-alpha-2, which will suppress your haploid-specific genes. You still have MAD-alpha-2 that suppresses your A-specific genes and nothing which is stimulating the alpha-specific genes. So this is the process once you've made that decision, once you've made the mating type switch, either presence of MAD-A1, presence of MAD-alpha-1 and MAD-alpha-2, or the two of them together. And again, diploid happens when you have an A cell that comes together with an alpha cell, and that's now diploid. It's also how you can get all of the homologous recombination that is going to happen when you undergo normal meiosis. Normally, yeast, we're going to go just mitosis, because they're replicating as a haploid cell. If ever they come together as a diploid, then you can have meiosis and recombination that happens at that point. So these are examples of how you've switched, once you've switched, how you stay in one particular state. And a more general way of looking at this is talking about positive feedback loops. And so this is just you know, a generality. You can think about you know, what's happening, particularly in the alpha cells or the A cells. You can think about this in the eyeless, which is expressing any time that you have a gene which stimulates the expression of itself, this is now a positive feedback loop. And the really nice thing about positive feedback loops is when you have cell division, so you've expressed here the A protein, which is critical for expression of the A gene to make more of the A protein. When you have cell division, some cells are going to have some A in it, and the other cells are going to have some A in it. This is now, you know, because your protein's been made, you've made it in multiple different copies, by the time you split two cells, each of those is going to have some proportion of that particular protein and it's going to express more of itself. And so this is a way you can have a cell memory process whereby as soon as you turn on the expression of A, that particular cell and all of its descendants are going to keep expressing A. And this is a way of, okay, there was a signal way back here in development, in some kind of process which says, okay, at some point in our development, we had A being turned on. Now we're going to keep A on. So this goes all the way back to where you're talking about right at the beginning of lecture. If you've got a very simple rule, left or right, turning on one protein, that protein can just stay on as long as it's got a positive feedback loop. Is there a question or just stretch up there? No, no worries. Are you going to go into what shuts that off? Ah, the, yeah. So how you can stop having this process going on. Um, in fact, that's what I was going to talk about right now. <laughs> So uh, probably one of the best examples of thinking about positive feedback loops and how the original molecular biologists started to think about gene regulation as far as this was concerned was in studying, of course, the most important kinds of biological organisms ever, the viruses. So this particular bacterial virus, um, also known as phage lambda, is a virus which infects bacteria it injects its genome inside the cell. How all this process happens is really wonderful and fascinating. Take virology next term. We'll talk much more about it. Um, but basically, you have now a genome of the virus. This is this red circle right here. There are really two things that can happen when the lambda genome gets inside a cell. The normal thing that people think about with a virus is that now this virus genome will make a whole bunch more virus. The virus will burst open the cell, make more extracellular particles of virus, the virion, which will go back and go through this cycle many, many times. However, right after this infection process, there's a, it's also called the genetic switch. This is what um, Mark Tashney came up with originally, uh, whereby the 
virus genome can also integrate into the cell. And it turns out most virus genomes on our planet are probably integrated rather like this. And so once this virus gets inside the cell, it's got to turn off all of the genes that would be important for replicating more virus, because it doesn't want to replicate more virus. It just wants to hang out inside the cell and make more of itself through this process. And so there are positive feedback loops that happen in this process to make sure that those genes are not turned on, and positive feedback loops in this other process where you have all of the viral genes being turned on. So of course the big question is how does this first event take place? And I'll gloss over that. We'll talk about it next time. But getting back to your question about how some of these positive feedback loops can be turned off, turns out that once the virus is inside the cell, it can chop itself back out and go through this whole process. And this we talked about really briefly when we talked about the <clears throat> SOS response, the Save Our Souls response, but it's a positive feedback loop that gets broken. And the way it gets broken is that you chop up the protein that's involved in it. And so that A protein we talked about for positive feedback loops in a second, also known as the lambda repressor, um, gets chopped up. And once you've chopped it up, then that can no longer continue to block its own activity, and your positive feedback loop stops. And so here, two different processes, lysis, which is the making more of the virus, or the lysogeny process, which is the genome hanging out inside the host. So here, in the lysogeny process, the lambda repressor is made, and it's still serving as a, um, it serves as a repressor here for all of these crow genes. But if you remember when we talked about crazy proteins that can, depending on exactly where they bind to DNA, can serve as a repressor or as an activator, this is what lambda repressor does. Lambda repressor is an activator of its own gene. So this is the positive feedback loop that you get with lambda repressor blocks all of the lysis genes, which is crow here, but is activating its own gene. Now, as soon as you break this apart, it turns out that now lambda repressor is not blocking these genes. It's not turning itself on. And so that's how you can escape from this positive feedback loop. Here, in the absence of lambda repressor, say you've chopped it up, now you make this crow protein, which it turns out the very first DNA binding protein that we looked at way back when, dimeric DNA binding proteins. Um, this CRO stands for control of repressor and other proteins. So it serves as a repressor of the lambda repressor gene, but stimulates its own transcription. And this now leads to expression of all the viral genes, the cell explodes, et cetera. So it's these two different positive feedback loops, and going from one to the other has to do with getting rid of one of these proteins. So, and again, we'll talk much more about this in virology, exactly how this works. So at this point, I wanted to <clears throat> sort of move away from the direct examples and talk about just some general principles, I should say, about how you can think about, and how more and more people are starting to think about how these gene regulatory systems are working. And this gets into what's called systems biology, or really trying to use engineering approaches to try and understand biology. And I had somebody ask me about this after lecture the other day and said, do you really believe any of this stuff, Dr. Stedman? And my answer was, it's reasonable. Um, I have a I think that this particular textbook gets a little bit too far into the whole circuitry and systems biology. And then Mark Tashney, who gave his talk over at Reed a couple of weeks ago, said it's all bollocks, um, completely worthless. So you can take some of this with a grain of salt. But there clearly are processes that are going on inside of cells that are, in fact, quite well described by some of these circuit diagrams or gene regulation circuits. We spent a lot of time talking about positive feedback loops. Again, this is the expression of one protein that leads to the expression of that same protein. You can also have negative feedback loops where a production of a gene will block the expression 
of that same gene. And we'll see that this is really important for keeping one particular gene product at a very defined level inside the cell. Flip-flop devices, which is just two negative regulatory events. So you have the A product will repress production of B, which will repress production of A. This is actually not at all unlike what we saw in lambda. See, the, the lambda repressor represses crow. Crow represses the lambda repressor. And so you'll have two different states. And you can flip back and forth between these two different states. This is the flip-flop device. Or we can also have these so-called feed-forward loops. And that's where the gene product of A will stimulate not only B, but also Z. But to get proper stimulation, like we talked about with Bicoid and Hunchback, you need two positive regulators in order to get Z to happen. So let's look at a couple of examples of these. Here's the feed-forward loop. Again, A and B are both required to get expression of Z. And people talk about this as a filter. And the reason people talk about this as a filter, if you have a signal which just goes for a very short period of time, then you'll turn on A, but that signal is now gone before you've had a chance to turn on B. And that's because transcription takes time, translation takes time. So you have this time delay process that happens if you need both to actually get this output. And basically what that means, if there's some kind of input, say be a steroid hormone that's being produced, if just a small amount of it which is made over a very short period of time, you're not going to turn on this final output. If, however, you're starving for a really long time and making a whole bunch of cortisol, then there'll be enough time for B to be made as well as A, and you'll end up with a response here finally at Z. And so it's a way that the cell can literally sense time, which is really kind of cool. You know, just two regulatory proteins driving a third regulatory protein is a way that the cell can actually measure how long things are going for. Positive feedback, as we just talked about, this is really a cell memory process. Once you've started turning something on, as long as it's giving its own regulation, it's going to continue at that same level. You'll always have something which is on there, unless you have some extra kind of regulatory system like we talked about for lambda, where you're getting rid of that protein somehow. Uh, negative feedback, if you think about repressing the expression of that same gene, that's going to keep things at a very narrow level. If you make more of one particular gene product, it's going to sh slow down the production of that gene product. If you have less of that gene product, it's not going to be shutting down its own expression, so you end up with more. So you end up with a nice equilibrium um, in these negative feedbacks. And then the flip-flop is you know, turning one thing on, and that will turn another one off. So if you put all these things together, and this is a very simplified version of what happens very early on in development of sea urchins. Sea urchins are great because you can go out to the coast and collect a whole bunch of them. Um, but they also have big cells. You can follow exactly what's going on with them, look at how each gene is being turned on or turned off. And this is that overall process here. You know, feed forward loops, feedback loops, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the basic take home message here is that you need an engineering degree to figure out what's going on with all of these things. So the last example I wanted to talk about in terms of gene regulators is something that people have literally made. And so you can take different genes using recombinant DNA techniques and put regulatory sequences next to them. And in this case, it's a <clears throat> regulatory sequence, which is just a repressor. If you express this repressor, it's got a binding site for that repressor next to another gene which encodes a repressor, next to another gene that encodes a repressor for this very first repressor up at the top here. And just because, again, it takes time to transcribe and translate different genes, this will give you expression of A, which will get to a certain level, and then it will <clears throat> lead to expression of B, the expression of A will peak, that will now shut down B. B will peak, it'll shut down C. C will peak, it'll shut down A. 
And so in this process, you can literally get oscillation of different gene products. And people have done this. Again, this is a, a real example down here at the bottom. Uh, if you think about oscillating products, what's the sort of classic oscillation that you want to have? Oops. Hello? Hmm. It's interesting. <laughs> the lights go out? Not sure what. Um, <clears throat> oscillation of gene products. Where, where do you usually see oscillation of, of gene products? Where would you want to think about that? Cancer, probably not so much. Un unfortunately, cancer is usually on all the time. What happens when the lights go out? Which they were trying to do just a second ago. Melatonin. So melatonin, which is important for what? Circadian rhythms. So things that get turned on and off on a regular basis. So if you think about how all of our cells work, um, they're all dependent on an approximately 24-hour clock. And it turns out that how those are regulated is a very similar process to what's going on here. You know, how genes are being turned on and turned off on a almost 24-hour cycle. So, um, so yes, crazy examples that you can make in the lab but are also important for how... <clears throat> questions about these you know, circuit cycles, um, et cetera, before we talk about some more gene repression um, kinds of issues completely blown away, too much information, too many acronyms. What's he going to ask us on the exam? <laughs> think, um, think feed forward, think positive feedback, think negative feedback. Um, those are sort of the important things because hopefully I've talked about them multiple times. Yes? Good. Get the general concepts. Um, exam. Part of this is all general conceptual because I'm not talking about the individual proteins here. This is very much a, a conceptual kind of thing. On the other hand, we will now talk about some specific proteins. And this has to do with gene repression, and particularly gene repression in eukaryotic systems, where genes get turned way, way, way down. And so the process there has to do with DNA methylation. So we've talked about histone methylation happening on the side chains, mostly of the tails of the various different histones. We also have DNA methylation. We talked about DNA methylation a little bit when we talked about DNA repair. Uh, if you have 5-methylcytosine, that gets deaminated, what happens? You have thymidine. And are there repair mechanisms for dealing with thymidine? No, because it's a normal base pair. And so um, if you methylate cytosine and have deamination, this can lead to lots of mutations. And it turns out that a lot of spontaneous mutations that happen in, um, curiously enough, mostly vertebrates happen because of deamination of 5-methylcytosine. Well, why would you bother to methylate cytosine if it ends up creating all of these different mutations? Well, it's because methylation of cytosine is now going to change the I should have brought my model with me, uh, chemicals in the major group of DNA, because that's where that 5-methyl group is sticking here. And so it's going to change interactions of proteins with the DNA. And if you had a normal, say, a gene regulatory protein that's going to bind to DNA at a specific sequence, it's now not going to be able to bind there anymore. And so it's a way of regulating binding of DNA binding proteins. Uh, doesn't change base pairing at all, because all the base pairing is happening over here on this side. If you look in the genome, they're in CPG islands. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, CPG just is basically 5 prime C followed by G. And the P here just stands for your phosphate in between the two of them. Uh, if you have DNA methylation at these CG sequences, after you have replication, there's a specific protein called a maintenance methyltransferase, again, very boring name here, uh, that will recognize sequences which are hemimethylated. Now, hemimethylated we talked about when we talked about bacterial replication. You have hemimethylation right after you start your replication, which says this has just been replicated. Here, in eukaryotic systems, the maintenance methyltransferase will bind to hemimethylated DNA and methylated on the other side. 
Turns out very similar things happen to bacteria, it's just bacteria are usually not methylating their cytosines. Uh, so after replication, you can see you can maintain now this methylation state because of these methyl transferases. Turns out that DNA methylation is not just important for binding to different regulatory fractures, it's also critical for development. If you have a mutation in the maintenance methyl transferase, uh, all kinds of problems happen in terms of gene regulation. Um, people have made these particular mutations in mice, and you find that that particular mouse can never even develop properly. It dies really quickly during embryogenesis. Um, and that says that you know, this process is really important. And it turns out that it's mostly important for suppressing the expression of genes when they're supposed to be turned off. And so that process of turning off genes, we already talked about when you are going to methylate your histones, and that will cause formation of heterochromatin, then very often you also end up methylating the DNA as well, which really compacts and really shuts off any of those genes. And it turns out that shutting off genes is probably almost as important as turning on genes um, through a developmental process. So if you look at where you have C's and G's, particularly CG in the genome, they're very often present in these so-called CPG islands. So what's a CPG island? A CPG island is just a whole stretch of CG, 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 CG. Very often, 1,000 nucleotides or so that's very rich in CGs. Turns out that if you look in the whole human genome, or for that matter, any vertebrate genome, you only see these CG sequences in very specific parts of the genome. And so part of the question is, well, why is that? Why do you have CG sequences only in a very few parts of the genome? Turns out that the reason for that is if you have them elsewhere in the genome, then you have methylation that takes place. And if you have methylation, you'll have deamination, because you can't stop deamination. It just happens because we're in an aqueous environment at a, a temperature that we're happy with, 37 degrees Celsius. And so you have deamination of any kind of C that is methylated and stays methylated for long periods of time. So the places where you have lots of CGs together are places where there's some reason that you don't want to have methylation that takes place, and probably, and again, it turns out there are these things, proteins which will take off any methylation that gets put there where you have regions of the genome which you don't want to be silenced. So you don't want to have heterochromatin forming there. And it turns out these are, not surprisingly, in promoter regions where you need to assemble the RNA polymerase, the mediator, all the general transcription factors, et cetera. You need to get all of these things together to the promoter, which has got methylated C's in it. It's going to be a real pain. So you have to have some way of making sure that methylation doesn't happen there. And so, not surprisingly, all these guys are present at promoters. And in fact, you can almost identify promoters uh, by going through vertebrate genomes and finding where these CPG islands are. Uh, because that's, that's where they are next to these genes which are always being made. And classic example here are the ribosomal protein genes. You always need to make ribosomal proteins. This is what's called a housekeeping gene. Um, number of these proteins, DHFR, and again, not critical, I can't even pronounce most of these names. Uh, these are proteins, or genes, I should say, for proteins that are required all the time in all cell types. Why do you see islands? This is basically what I said before. If you'd had lots of <clears throat> methylation in a particular region of the genome, those CG sequences are going to become TG sequences because of the <clears throat> deamination of 5-methylcytosine. And so any of those mutations will turn out to remove any of those Cs that are in CGs. Unless, of course, you happen to need the activity of that particular CG, probably because you have a specific binding protein like at a promoter. And so those are going to be maintained over evolutionary time, and that's why you end up with these CPG islands. And yeah, check that out, 20,000 CPG islands, about how many 
genes do we have in our genome? About 20,000. It's really pretty amazing how evolution works from this point of view. So what again is DNA methylation doing? It's mostly involved in shutting down transcription and particular parts of the genome that you don't want to be expressing the genes from. DNA methylation in and of itself is not completely sufficient to really shut down expression of genes. You also need modifications of the histones. And this happens in the process that we talked about before when we talk about the histone modification proteins. So histone read writer complexes. So you'll have some initial event that happens, gene regulatory protein, that's going to bind to a specific sequence under a particular condition. Could be sometime in development. Basically, it says, this is a region of the genome that we don't want to be expressing these genes in. So once that will associate with the DNA, now you have, and this would be a classic example of what? If you're shutting down expression, something that doesn't bind to DNA, but it's going to cause repression of gene expression, say what? Co-repressor, exactly. So a co-repressor here, which modifies the histones. And so this would be an indirectly functioning co-repressor, direct would be interacting directly with the transcriptional machinery. Here, indirectly modifies the histones in such a way to pull those histones together, to compact your DNA. And if you have a read-writer complex, it will recognize that modification. Again, this is usually going to be methylation of side chains, particularly lysine side chains in histones, not always. There's also methylation that leads to expression. But here, methylation of side chains, which then will bind to your code reader, which also binds to this co-repressor, which will modify the histones next to it, which will modify the histones next to it, which will modify the histones next to it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These modified histones now will interact with DNA methylases, and those DNA methylases will methylate the DNA. So methylated histones are something that these DNA methylases will bind to. And now you have methylated DNA, methylated histones, and then binding proteins that are going to bind to this methylated DNA. So you've got modified histones, binding proteins bound to those histones, modified methylated DNA, and proteins bound to that. And in that process, you can go from a gene being on to a gene being off, and so off that it's one millionth of the expression that you had before. So really impressive, the amount of silencing or turning off of genes that can happen in eukaryotic systems. And that's because of this whole process of methylating your histones, binding proteins binding to these methylated histones, methylating the DNA, and binding proteins bound to those. Um, and this will really shut down the expression of particular genes. Turns out in bacteria, because they don't have all these extra processes, you don't get anywhere near as much kind of suppression of gene expression. What are some of the most heavily silenced genes in eukaryotes? What does it say at the bottom of the slide? Transposons. Do you want genes jumping around your genome all the time? No. How do you deal with the fact that almost half of our genome is made up of these transposons? You silence the heck out of them. And you know, binding to all of these different factors leads to this whole process. So most of the time, methylation of DNA is going to be important for this whole gene silencing process. And again, often for genes that are otherwise going to be pretty toxic to your genome, like transposons. <clears throat> but there are some examples where DNA methylation is, in fact, involved in expression of genes or differential regulation of genes. And this gets us to the phenomenon called genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting is really weird. Um, and genomic imprinting basically is that if you've inherited a gene from one or the other of your parents, that's the gene which is going to be expressed. So it's not the classic case where you get you know, different alleles from different parents. Those will be expressed in various different concentrations, various different amounts. Here, in this particular case, <clears throat> if you have an allele from 
one parent, and in this case, um, it's the allele from, <clears throat> let's see, the uh, male cell, male mouse from the father, that's the one which is going to be um, expressed. This particular allele here is always going to be expressed the same way that it was impressed, um, expressed in the male. How that happens has to do with methylation, and there are about 300 human genes that this seems to be the case for, and it's also true in mice. So about, you know, 20,000 genes, 300, yeah, two to 300. So a couple of percent of the genes are regulated this way. So what happens here is you've got called imprinting, and it turns out that imprinting has to do with methylation, but this is now specific methylation. It's not maintenance methylation. It's not CPG methylation. It's very specific places in your genome which are being methylated. Here, um, female allele, the orange allele is being imprinted, the male also. Now, germline forms in the males, the imprinting happens at that particular locus, and it's the only the imprinting from the male that happens. Female, all that imprinting is gone. So in this case, only the male copies of this allele are the ones which are going to be expressed in the offspring. And it doesn't matter if those offspring are male or female. So here, the sperm are now imprinted. Those imprinted genes are the ones that get passed along here. And so here, <clears throat> the alleles are going to be the alleles that came from either the male or the female. They're examples of both. And so sometimes they'll get an uh, imprint from male, sometimes they'll get imprint from the female. So just mom's genes or just dad's genes. How does this work? Um, very often what happens here, and this is the best study of these cases, the insulin-like growth factor gene. We have maternally inherited chromosome that is non-methylated, paternally expressed, inherited, sorry, is methylated. The methylation turns out to be at an insulator element. What insulators do? Block activity of enhancer binding proteins. So block the um, activity of enhancer binding protein. That's what happens in your maternally inherited chromosome. So here, no activity of IGF2. Paternally, this is methylated. The methylation here means that the proteins that have to bind to insulator sequences, remember insulators are just DNA sequences. They don't do anything unless there's a protein bound to them. If you don't have binding to these, then you're not going to be blocking the activity of the enhancer, so you get expression. So IGF2 expression only from the paternally inherited chromosome because of methylation of one of these insulator sites. Now, it turns out this is absolutely critical for fetal development. If you have mutations in IGF2, you have mutations in this sequence, then the fetus is not going to develop properly. So this is that process right here. The last kind of imprinting process, again, it's methylation of specific sequences here. Now this is a case of the maternal sequence, which is being methylated. Here you have expression of a gene which is not important what it does. Um, normally made, gene is normally expressed. If you don't have methylation here, there's another promoter, which is inside this gene, which will produce an RNA, and that RNA leads to silencing of this particular gene. How the process works is really fascinating and interesting, but we don't have time to talk about it today or probably even for the rest of the course. Um, we'll talk about exon activation on Wednesday. Questions, again, please email me about that, um, and I will try and get this posted as quickly as possible.